You're listening to Seattle Real Estate Podcast. Hey, everybody. I'm Sean Reynolds, the owner of Summit Properties Northwest, Reynolds and Client Appraisal, and your host of this episode of the Seattle Real Estate Podcast. My next guest began his career as a home inspector, where he learned a great deal about what goes on behind the walls of houses, both old and new. He went on to manage a mold remediation franchise and saw a need for more honest service providers in the industry. After becoming a certified mold professional, he started Mold Mentor with a mission to combine unbeatable service with sensible and effective solutions to restore air quality and prevent moisture issues in homes and buildings. Welcome, Mr. Zach Duffy to the Seattle Real Estate Podcast. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me and for working through the technical difficulties to get to this point. I am in the field, as you already know. Yeah, you're a busy guy. You're out in the field in between inspections. You told me that uh, Ohio, and you're in Columbus, Ohio, correct? That's right. And you just had some major flooding, and so your services are in need right now. They are, yep. And so you're just, how many inspections will you do in a day? Or what, what, what kind of stuff? do you typically work on after a, after a flood like that? So I've, I can have actually multiple jobs overlapping where I'm, I'm, de- I'm drying out a basement with the equipment and then I have to run over to another location and do an inspection. And so when you say how many inspections will I do in a day, I could be doing three to four inspections while I have two separate jobs going on. Right. So it's, okay. a, it's a delicate balancing act. Yeah. So you're hopping right now, in other words. Right. Absolutely. Right. And then, and then you're hopping at home because when you go home, you've got five kids. Yeah. yeah. Dad, you're, <laughs> you're leaving for work. And I said, Hey, it's a work day. You, you got, daddy's got to go to work. Daddy's got to pay the bills. Right. Yep. That's awesome. Okay. So as you and I kind of talked about, I own a real estate brokerage and an appraisal company. So I'm going to jump right into some questions that both real estate brokers and probably appraisers have concerning, concerning houses with mold. And so what do you do when a house you're listing has mold? What kind of things as you as a mold professional, real estate brokers got a house. Oh man, I think it's got mold. What do I do? Well, um, so yeah, that can go a number of directions. Um, This is a pre-listing house you're talking about. Yeah, maybe a real estate broker knows he's going to have a listing come up, but the house, he's pretty sure it's got mold. So should he reach out to a mold professional? Should he try and fix it himself? What are his options and, and what should he be thinking? I would I would start by saying I think it's totally appropriate um, on the dis- residential disclosure form to if, to state, you know, we, we've, we know of some minor moisture intrusion and some of it's been accompanied by some discoloration. I don't think you ever need to disclose on a residential property form that you have mold unless it's been tested by a laboratory because uh, only a laboratory really can can determine if uh, a microorganism is mold or not. So we have to send a sample to them. So that being said, we can start there and go one of two ways. Um, if, if an agent is concerned about a, a future listing uh, having mold, he can have it tested to confirm or rule out a mold problem. Okay. Um, or he could do nothing and, and just disclose moisture intrusion, maybe some discoloration. Okay. Okay. Or, so, or, or treat it. Or treat it. Yeah. So. And, and how often do you recommend, how often do you take the phone call and you're like, okay, it sounds like you've got a major mold problem or you've got a minor mold problem. Can you kind of identify that based on what somebody's telling you? Or do you have to really rip into things to kind of know what you're dealing with in a house? So it depends on if the customer is paranoid, I, I guess, for lack of uh, other descriptive words, or if they are, if they are, um, you know, uh, of sound mind and, and health. And I can have photos sent to me, texted to me, and I can say, look, that's a shower that needs some deep cleaning, some common scrubbing. I don't think you have a, have an issue. After, of course, I ask a few other questions. Um, and, and, and they can be happy with that. Thank you so much. You know, I never had to go to the house. It was a minor issue. You know, the EPA recommends if a mold contamination is less than 10 square feet of surface area, it's likely that the, the homeowner can deal with it, um, with it without a, the help of a professional. So my first question is, how much are we seeing? How much area does this cover? Now, if it could be behind walls, then we can't see with the naked eye how much surface area could be covered. Um, so... 
yeah, I, I get I get the call all the time. Could this be serious or not? And it's, and, and I try and feel out the scope of, of possible mold growth. And most most times I end up having to go out, but I can answer questions over the phone and, and solve problems a lot of times. Right. Okay. How often does somebody send you a picture and we've all walked into that house where an entire like family is covered in the walls? What do you recommend in that situation where there's obviously some massive mold? Should somebody be walking through that room? <clears throat> somebody, I walk, I'll walk through a room like that without even a mask on sometimes because I know I'm only getting going to be walking through for 30 seconds, a couple minutes at most, taking a okay. look, looking with a flashlight. And I'm not allergic, so I, I'm not going to have allergic reactions to that. Um, I, in order to have um, toxigenic reactions or become symptomatic and, and poisoned from mold, like we have to live in that environment for prolonged amounts of time, months or years even. Um, so, yeah, I'm not worried about quick walkthroughs. Um, if, okay. For the person living there, I would say that what you just described, Sean, sounds like a, an urgent situation, probably for the inhabitants. But what you're saying is that for 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 like a real estate broker, I've had brokers call me and say, "Hey, there's mold in this house. Should I even be inside?" Because I think there's such a push in the media towards be very very afraid of black mold because it's going to kill you on sight. You know what I mean? And yeah. And it sounds like from what you're describing is that it's a time exposure thing to mold that you need to be worried about, not necessarily running in as a real estate broker, but you need to be concerned for the inhabitants of the home more than anything who are going to who live there. Right. Yeah. Just walking through that house. I mean, as a broker, you'll know, you'll know if you're starting to experience reactions. I mean, you're, you're itchy. What are, what are your reactions? If you start experiencing those it's time to get out. Right. So if right. you're not, if you're not, I would say that your body is handling uh, whatever is in that house just fine. And you're, you're going to leave w without any uh, reactions whatsoever. Right. And so some people have an allergic reaction to mold and other people do not. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Like myself, uh, for example, I can, I can go into the moldiest basements where there's slugs growing in the basement. Like there's plant, there's plant life, there's algae, and there's mold everywhere and it stinks. And I might, my gag reflex will, will catch up to me at some point, but I don't have any, I don't react to it any, any other way. I don't get, okay. And I'm, I'm, a, I do have outdoor allergies to like some sort of grass seasonal stuff, but mold's not one of them. Okay. Okay. So different people react differently. And if you know that you're somebody who reacts to mold, then it's probably in your best interest to kind of stay away. Let somebody else handle it that is less allergic. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so let's go back to, all right, a real estate broker or a seller finds a little bit of mold in their bathroom. It's under a 10 square foot area. It's a pretty small area. What kind of things can they do if they wanted to maybe take care of that themselves? If you have said, hey, based on this photo, this doesn't appear to be an extreme problem. What should somebody do to get rid of that kind of smaller contained mold problem? Yeah, well, if it's a bathroom, I mean, if it's a shower, bleach can be used um for one bleach is not engineered for uh mold um disinfecting but it it can be effective to clean showers and, and get discoloration off um white vinegar can change the alkalinity uh of the surface and kill mold spores white vinegar has been known to kill mold so it's been um lab lab tested to to be able to kill mold spores in, in small amounts okay so a couple common things but really a good scrub brush you know um so showers just a, need routine, routine cleaning, ba basic cleaning, basic cleaning. So if you did a quick Google search, you could probably figure out what the solution is that you need to clean and then just get in there and clean it. If it's a small enough project. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Sounds good. A lot of I will add a lot of times in bathrooms, the mold that we're seeing is related to the moisture. Okay. So in, inside of a shower, maybe we need to start using a squeegee. After we get out of the shower, we squeegee out the walls. That's how we keep glass sliding doors clean in a shower from getting sp splotchy is a squeegee. That's that right. extra work. Most people aren't going to want to do that. Now, if it's on, if it's in the bathroom, but it's outside the shower, like on the drywall or on the ceiling, 
that's probably a ventilation issue. And it's a surface mold growth from moisture inside the bathroom. It's, it's not an indication that you have mold growing behind the walls or that moisture is getting behind the walls or even in the attic. It's that you're filling up that bathroom with steam and maybe we need to check that bathroom vent fan in the ceiling. Maybe it's old or tired or it's not, it's blocked up in the attic. Maybe it's not venting properly. And so we have too much moisture in the bathroom for too long of a time that we start to grow mold. And in that case, usually we can hand clean that soap and water. And away you go, easy fix. Right, right. So everything you're saying is mold needs moisture to live, correct? Exactly right, yeah, mold needs food and water. Right, so you get rid of the food and water and you've kind of got problem solved. That's right, and since homes are uh, built of, of food sources for mold, which is dead plants, and so we'll, in, in a home, that's, that's the wood framing and the paper on the drywall uh, and things like that. Um, we can't control the food. There is going to be, our houses are constructed of food sources for mold. All we can control is the moisture at that point. Important to keep the home dry with proper ventilation, um, you know, air conditioning in the summer, um, a proper insulation and things like that, buttoned up and dry. Right, right. And that's one of the things that I hear about all the time is the difference between the older styled homes that are more vented out because they're not quite as tight airflow wise versus the newer homes that are very tight as far as insulation, you know, windows all wrapped up. If you don't have airflow, you could have a potential mold problem in a new home. So it's almost counter to intuitive to what you would think about where mold grows. Is that roughly correct? Yeah, airflow is very important. Airflow is how stagnant, moist air that might have a little bit of humidity in it gets, um, it gets moved around so that it can be um, you know, uh, air conditioned, whether it's the air conditioning system through the furnace or whether it's a, a dehumidifier that we have or both. Um, all basements should have a dehumidifier as a backup. They're effortless, they're easy these days. You can buy a dehumidifier for $300 or less. Um, a 70 pint moisture removal is what you want. They're rated in how many pints can this unit remove in a day? How many pints of moisture? And I recommend 70 pint minimum, okay? And you set that up in your basement, you, you dial in your set point uh, for relative humidity. Um, a healthy range is 35 to 50% relative humidity. So I set mine in my basement at 45%. The unit senses the air, samples the air on a regular basis and it kicks on as needed. And then it shuts itself off. Okay, okay. And you can buy this. Can you buy it at Home Depot? Can you buy it Walmart? Home Depot, Costco, yep. Okay, okay, okay. And so is it uh, the bigger the unit, the better as far as de dehumidifiers go? So the rating is in pints per day moisture removal, and that doesn't change the size of the unit usually. The housing of the unit looks the same. It might be a little bit heavier because the compressor, uh, the condenser is, is, is more sizable. Um, but yeah, you're not going to go by how big is the unit. Um, you're going you're gonna to look at the rating and see how many pints per day. They make them in 35, 50, 70. And, and I say go to 70. Spend the money on 70. It's portable. You can take it with you um, to your next house. Uh, it doesn't run continuously. I mean, it can, but it's not going to just sit there and run. It's it's more, think of it like a backup system. Um, if it gets so humid during a summer day that your air conditioner is undersized or your air conditioner is old or for whatever reason, your air conditioner is not keeping up with the relative humidity in the basement, which by the way is 60% relative humidity uh, is the threshold for mold growth. We have an environment conducive to mold growth at 60%. And if uh, a, um, a dehumidifier as a backup can help keep that in a healthy range when an air conditioner can't keep up. Okay. Okay. So you're saying it's, it's a great backup system to have just a dehumidifier in a basement area where there's maybe some moisture coming in up through the floor or for whatever reason in through the walls, something along those lines. Yes. Every, I'm of the school of thought that every basement should have one. Um, I did a new okay. build. I did mold remediation on a new build where there was mold all over the floor, floor joists. It was an unfinished basement. The new build had sat for a year and a half on the parade of homes here in, in central Ohio and then was and then was uh, on the market, got into contracts, and the home inspector found mold, in the, and the, the, the home builder was in denial. Um, I had to walk through 
um, and, and demonstrate where this mold growth was. And, and he was scratching his head because it was a new build, never been used. Um, there should have been a properly sized dehumidifier dropped into that basement after it was built. Okay. So it had in excess of 60% humidity, didn't have airflow, just mold was sitting down there doing its thing. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. So yep. uh, mold, mold grows under, under humid conditions and it's a, it's a sneaky kind of mold. It's not something that shows up as a black uh, on the wall. It, you, have to, you have to be trained to discover this type of mold that grows under humidity. Um, you have to point your flashlight in the right direction um, to try and cast shadows from this mold. And, and anyway, I could go on, but um, a liquid, a liquid uh, on the contrast, a liquid uh, mold growth, you're going to see that. It's going to show up in a localized spot. It's going to be black and slimy, um, but not the humidity. So we have to mind the water source um, for mold growth depending on its state, whether it's a gas or a liquid. Okay. Okay. And I saw within your website, some pointers on how to keep so since moisture is such a big thing with mold on how to keep moisture out of your home. So we've talked about once moisture is already inside the home. Let's talk a little bit about how to keep moisture out of the home from from the outside perspective. So <clears throat> we'll start with um, the for basic framing. I mean, your walls should be insulated. That's good uh, to have insulation in the walls because you're putting a barrier. Um, you're put, kind of putting a, a, a barrier where you're not going to have condensation. If your walls are uninsulated and it's freezing cold outside during the freezing months, and then the inside is being heated and people are breathing and living and showering, you're filling the, the warm air inside up with moisture, which is going to be attracted to the cold exterior walls that are uninsulated and you're gonna get condensation, water droplets on the walls. And over time, that will cause a problem uh, to the paint, it will grow mold, things like that. So insulation is first, insulation for the exterior walls and of course the attic, okay? The okay. next would be, yeah, the next would be ventilation um, for the attic. So the attic needs to have an intake and an output. Um, the current building, um, ventilation today is a soffit vent to a ridge vent. That's kind of the, the, um, the most desirable uh, ventilation system for an attic. It's the intake air is at the lowest point of the roof, which is the soffit. And the output air is at the highest point of the roof, which is the ridge vent. Ridge, yeah. And so we have the best passive vent system at that point, okay? Um, when it comes to a basement, uh, the dehumidifier is very important. Um, a finished basement can be um, can be tricky. A finished basement, we're finishing basements with with studs, with wood. Well, basements, basement walls breathe moisture, and that's normal because there's wet earth up on the other side of that uh, that that foundation wall, and we can't control that. So we so so an unfinished basement, we we have if, as long as there's air moving down there. Any, any moisture that's breathing in from those foundation walls is being uh, dealt with at the, at the point of uh, the air conditioner. But once we trap that moisture in by framing that wall, that, that can be problematic. So um, if we're going to finish the basement, we should have a vapor barrier on the foundation wall. And a vapor barrier can be as simple as a piece of six millimeter plastic, visqueen plastic that covers that wall before the studs go in place. Um, um, if you want to take the step up, you can use um, extruded polystyrene. It's um, it looks like a glorified styrofoam board. Yeah, it's big, four foot by eight foot sheets of one inch to two inch thick uh, extruded polystyrene. You can cut, you can la layer your foundation wall with that stuff, tape the seams, and now you've got a vapor barrier and an R value of insulation included in one job. And then you can frame your studs right up against that. So um, that's how we control moisture in a basement. A crawl space, crawl spaces get neglected uh, very often because they don't get the concrete slab that a basement gets. Basements get three inches of concrete and that concrete that you're walking on in the basement acts as a sort of vapor barrier, even though it can still breathe moisture like a wall, a foundation wall, it, it, it acts as sort of a vapor barrier. But the, a lot of times crawl spaces are finished with just gravel on top of the dirt and there's no vapor barrier. So crawl spaces should 
should be looked at as there should be a piece of plastic covering all ground space uh, in a crawl space. Yeah, va vapor barrier. Yeah, visqueen vapor barrier. Right. Yeah. For those dealing with the crawl space who are curious about more information, just Google uh, crawl space encapsulation. Uh, Do-it-yourself crawl space encapsulation. They can be very costly, but they're very effective at keeping moisture and odor down in a crawl space to protect the rest of the home. Um, and so those are kind of the main touch points, I think, is um, ventilation, insulation, and then, of course, the basement and the, and the crawl space. What about what about like major drainage projects around the home? Because in Seattle, as you probably well know, it rains like nine months out of the year. So our ground is saturated with water and we see a lot of drainage type projects go on because people are trying to keep that water out of the home. Yeah. So the simple answer for me is if. So you're talking about. Um, well, perimeter drains inside of a basement that lead to a sump pump. That's the, yeah, the interior. And then the other is the exterior where you've got French drains outside, correct? Yeah, yeah, you can do that. That's not, that's not as common here in, in central Ohio to have uh, French drains installed um, on the exterior of the home to protect the, the basement from water intrusion. We, we see a lot of uh, perimeter drains being installed um, in sump pumps and basements than we do. Um, I, the talk out here is in, in Ohio is um, digging up the foundation or, or the um, digging up the dirt along the foundation on the exterior of the home in order to uh, waterproof the yep. walls with some yep. sort of a membrane. Okay. And, and th in that case, I guess they might go an extra measure and, and do a, a French drain, but I, I really don't hear any talk about that when I when I when I talk to other companies and customers who have had work done. That's not. The perimeter drains are going in inside the basements out here uh, in large part. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Because we see, from what I know and from my experience as an appraiser, um, see a lot of exterior type projects. And I think it's just because we get, you know, such extended periods of rain where it doesn't come down hard, but the ground is saturated and we do our best to kind of keep that water from, from getting into the basement foundation walls. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me, Zach, how did you get in to the mold? How'd you get into the mold business? So I got my start in the mold industry as a home inspector. That was a relationship that was uh, developed when I was inspecting homes. Um, it was a, it was a, fran a local franchisee of a, a national company um, called Green Home Solutions. And, uh, that's where I, I got to go out to, to Pittsburgh um, to get my formal training, my field training uh, from the franchise headquarters and learned a lot out there. Um, you know, I, I, this is kind of funny, but I it, it hit me when I started my business that, you know, I had spent seven years um, uh, as kind of making wine and mead in my basement. Okay. And I loved it. I, I, I had multiple recipes going on and people were, people loved sipping on the honey wine that I was making. It's called mead. But my, mm. my, uh, my favorite part about it was the yeast. And I, I read books on yeast and, and the yeast has, has the most uh, impact on the overall flavor. Um, it's not necessarily what ingredients you're using. It's how the yeast can react with those ingredients. And I became very familiar with the microorganism when I researched yeast. And it was, it wasn't until after I started my business that I, I realized why it came so naturally to learn about the mold spore and about how mold reacts in different environments and about how to control mold. Um, but you know, when, once I left my, um, position with that franchisee, I went on to get my real estate license and I graduated in December of 2017. And then January of 2018, I had already gotten enough phone calls from people who had my phone number asking for opinions on mold in their home that I never practiced real estate. I started, mm. I started, mold, I started mold mentor at that point. Interesting. So you're like, Hey, I've already got all these connections instead of trying to crank up a new business plan, which is being a real estate agent, you decided, Hey, let's run with this and, and keep this going. And, and at that point, that's when you started mold mentor. Is that right? That's right. You got it. Okay. Okay. What does a, what does a, a standard day, if there ever is one 
in somebody who's self-employed. What's your average day look like? Um, my average day would start with um, either a job or an investigation. An investigation is really, a, I think I've got a problem um, and I'll come out uh, and take a look. So, and those, those appointments range from five minutes to 45 minutes, depending on how much they want to talk. Um, and, uh, but a job would start, um, I would show up and I would, uh, you know, start setting up containment uh, for the job that we were about to do and bringing equipment. So really I should have a small car that I would, if I, if I, I try and uh, separate my days from investigations, I like to do Tuesday and Thursday, for example, uh, line up, schedule all my appointments for, for, you know, looking at jobs and, and writing quotes for the same day. And I could have a small car for that instead of this big work van. Um, like a commuter car. Right. Yeah. Okay. And so, um, but being, you know, being in my third year of business for myself, um, I've got straight A's almost 70 reviews on Angie's list, um, 2018, 2019 nice. super service award. Yeah. I'm, I've been working really hard at taking care of each customer and that's caused my business to grow organically, uh, by word of mouth and whatnot. Um, but you know, the days that get rough are, are when I've got multiple jobs going on and I'm getting phone calls. I'm already in a crawl space trying to uh, do mold remediation and my phone's ringing. And, and so I'm at, I'm at kind of a limbo space where I'm not quite ready to support the business isn't quite ready to support a full-time employee yet. So I've got several people uh, that I call on and, and I do the 1099 thing with them for bigger jobs where it's a okay. basement demo and we, we have to rent a dumpster and things like that. So independent contractors that you can count on if you need some overflow help. Exactly. Okay. 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 So your, your business is kind of at that point where you probably need somebody close to full time, but you're just not quite there yet. And so you're probably having to work a bunch of extra hours. So you don't have to pay somebody full time because when it gets a little bit slower, then you're like, Oh, what am I going to have that person do? Is that kind of kind of the, the space that you're at? That's the space I'm at exactly, and I'm. But I've got, I've got, I've got lots of ideas right now and things in the works to, um, to make it happen. So I'm, I'm really hoping for an employee this year. Um, okay. Sure, it has to happen for next season, next year. Okay. And one of your your marketing things is to try and get on as many podcasts as you can. Correct. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Because it's I'll, I'll, what I'm learning. I'm, I'm not a digital space kind of a guy, but but my. Um, my buddy is who, who is who I've partnered with. And, and what I'm learning is the more, uh, the more platforms we can be on, like now we're going to have to, we have a YouTube channel, but I don't think we have anything on there yet. So this might be the first. Okay. The more activity that blogging and things like that, the more activity I can leverage and post, the more Google likes my business and wants to put me at the, on the first page of results. So you get the Google, you get the Google love. That's right. We get, we get shown love by Google and, so that's kind of one of the, um, that was the initial idea for podcasts. And to be honest, yep. I, think the pod, I thought the podcast thing sounded like a long shot, but he got, he got three hits for podcasts and in, in what, like a month's time. So yeah, it works. And the thing with podcasting is that you can, so Google your number one search engine in the world. Number two search engine, YouTube. So if you put up some stuff on YouTube, right into Google and then what we do with the podcast is we video it. So we actually make it a vodcast. So you've got, you've got all this little, this stuff that all connects. You've already got a really good blog on your website. You start putting in some videos there. And I think you'll see things really take off because you've already got a pretty good footing. Let's also talk about, so you've got Instagram. So you could do Instagram uh, IGTV with some longer content video, take that same video you're putting on YouTube, put that on IGTV. And then on Facebook, you can do longer content video there as well, too. Good to know. There are, there's definitely room for improvement. And I've, I've got him, um, I've got his, he's, he's loaded with what he's doing right now. So I think he'll enjoy watching this, too. And we'll probably have some new ideas after this one. What would be fun to see is when you and I know I've, I've seen building inspectors do this with their Instagram is to take a bunch of video when you're out on site with just, 
you know, kind of wild and crazy stuff that people will find entertaining. That always gets a ton of attention because you see stuff that the rest of us will never see. Right. Oh, the repairs that I've seen where, where people are using cassette tapes to prop up uh, uh, an I-beam joist in a crawl space. And it's like, how did, how did that hold up? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's crazy stuff. All right. So, I, so we've kind of talked about seller or real estate broker. Um, we're going to jump, we're going to go to questions that buyers ask. And I've taken this right off of your website. And so um, is it safe to buy a home with mold in it? So and that would go back to the question of, is the person of, of um, sound mind and health, in my opinion, because if they are, then yes, they can, they can buy that house. And then they can kind of break down, you know, um, the mold situation afterwards. Um, it's uh, be, be, because we have to be exposed uh, in a prolonged amount of time to become symptomatic to mold, you can buy a house and move into it safely, even if it has mold. Um, but you certainly want to hone in and start monitoring, you know, the areas of concern. Uh, where is the moisture coming from? You know, is the mold changing? Is it growing? Um, you know, but you can deal with it after you move in a lot of times. So uh, there, there's a lot of scare and people are mold. They say home inspections are, are like the number one killer of a, of a deal, of a real estate deal. Yep. And appraisals are right behind that. <laughs> I, think, I think that, and I don't, I, I might be making this up, but it seems like um, during a home inspection, if, if I had to pick one item of a home inspection that would be ruining the deal, it might be mold. Um, yep. top of that list because it's, it's the fear of the unknown. Yep. What, what could this do to me? What could this do to my loved ones? We, I'm pregnant. You know, we have kids, granny visits. She has a guest room. Like it's the fear of the unknown, a, a bad roof. That's going to cost $15,000 replaced. There's nothing unknown about that. You just replace it. Yeah. That can, that can kill a deal, but I know, I, I know it's killing a deal because of, of the cost involved. The, the mold is like, is kind of for some people it's like a scarlet letter it's it's yeah. a verdict on, on the home it, it it's an embarrassment thing it's it's just it's really wild how how mold has worked its way into our, our fear culture and I, as a real estate broker i've had so many deals where my agent has called me and said we we've got mold in the home and I'm like, all right, well, let's talk about it. How, how big is it or how extensive is it? I don't know, but it's got mold and my buyers don't want it. We don't know what to do. People just freak out when they hear the mold, word mold because I think they envision just massive amounts of mold behind the wall where they can't see it. You know, their buyer ripping into the home and just this enormous mold issue. But most of the time, in my experience, it's not something, it's something that can be taken care of. Yeah, first thing I would say for your agents is don't don't ever use the term black mold because that's not a scientific type of mold. That's a media buzzword. Right. It's not professional to to say. I think that might not be black mold. You might be okay. That's it, it, of course it's not black mold. Black mold is not a type of mold. Um, so avoid using the term black mold if if your agent is asked by a buyer, is this black mold? Do you know, black mold doesn't exist in this in this world. Um, the only way to know what kind of mold that is, that it can be black. Any kind of mold can be black. But we would have to take a sample, take a sample to the lab on a Q-tip, um, and they could tell us what kind. But the, the kind of mold doesn't change the remediation process. I don't need to see a, a lab report to determine how I'm going to clean up. I have my method of removing the mold from the home, no matter what kind of mold. It doesn't. It, it doesn't change my process. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. That's that's super good to know. And so that's why throughout all your stuff, you're like, hey, don't, don't throw out the word black mold. It doesn't really exist as a type of mold. That is a media, if it bleeds, it leads type thing. Exactly. Clickbait. The original clickbait. Yeah. Like, like we've kind of experienced throughout the last several months of our lives, correct? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Boy, yeah. It, it, it's, it's wild because it's actually helped my business. People are are cooped up in their homes and now they're saying, honey, it's time we deal with this mold thing. It's going to affect our immune system. And then when we go back to work, you know, we're going to get COVID-19. And so I've getting, I've been getting a lot of calls from concerned people who are now spending most of their time in their home. Okay. 
Okay. So since they're not at the, since they're not at the office and they're having to deal with their house, they're like, let's give that mold guy a call and let's see what he says because we don't really want to be in here more than we should if we're exposed. So that's super interesting. So your business has benefited as a small business during this time. And it's probably also because we're thinking about airborne particles and that's part of the whole mold thing. Exactly. And we've been, we've been disinfecting uh, commercial facilities in our area um, with, with our disinfection process. And that's COVID-19. I had to, I had to have my attorney review some, some waiver form so that you know, I can feel good about offering um, a COVID disinfection service and whatnot. And so, yeah, this whole thing has helped help the, the bot, kind of the biohazard industry, I guess. Um, right. But to, to jump to jump back, I wanted to add also for your agents, it's important for them to know that they should suggest if they have a buyer in, in contract um, on a finished basement, a home with a finished basement, they should they, they should um, at least educate their buyer and say, hey, this this is the one place that's highly recommended to do air sampling. Um, is a finished basement that you don't know the history on that home. You don't know how that basement was finished. You don't know if there's a vapor barrier installed. And the only way to have an x-ray vision of that basement is to pull air sampling. Okay. Air sampling is a, is a, is a comparison of the outdoor air to the indoor air. The laboratory analyzes two samples, one outside and one taken inside. And whatever's outside should be found inside uh, in a similar amount. Okay. Okay. I, I say the outdoor air and the indoor air should be statistically the same. If the in, if the basement sample is ten times higher than the outdoor air, then that mold, that that would suggest that there's mold in that basement that's not naturally occurring from the outdoor air. It, it's occurring inside the basement. Um, and um, the only scare story I have of that is uh, I got called out to from for a buyer who. The, the, it was a finished basement. It looked great. There were no signs of, of odor or mold growth or moisture problems. But they, on a whim, they, they ordered an air sample of the basement, and it came back extremely elevated. I'm talking mm. uh, uh, 100,000 times the outdoor air. Wow. And, and, and the seller was in denial because he finished the basement. <laughs> and, he, and, and, and he called faulty test. <laughs> Fake news. <laughs> I, I went in there with a little bit of invasive investigation i was able to prove that there was no vapor barrier installed on the foundation wall in fact what he had done was he had framed the studs up against the foundation wall laid fiberglass bat insulation in between the studs and then stapled a vapor barrier onto the studs before putting drywall up therefore trapping trapping the moisture yeah and making and accelerating wow. what was already going to be a problem was now accelerated he created he created like the perfect mold lab culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. What's really what's really wild to think about is that they they had um, a young child and they were going to move into that home and the selling point was the basement for them. Oh. And if they hadn't if they hadn't pulled air samples, they would have not known. They wouldn't have known. They would have had their kid down in that environment, just huffing all of that that mold. And because it wasn't a, a liquid leak where it, it makes an ugly black spot, no one would have known for potentially more more years to come. Wow. Okay. How much? How much would one of those air the air sample tests cost? Like in in Ohio, what how, what does that run? Three hundred bucks should be should kind of be tops. I mean, if okay. Yeah, and, and and we always we always recommend one for the basement. If you if you want to get the upstairs another area in the home tested. The samples, additional samples from us are fifty dollars. Um, okay, kind of the, kind of the market rate, or at the the conservative end of the market rate. There's companies charging three fifty, but um, yeah, I don't know what it is out there. We're out west. It's probably somewhere. It's probably more expensive because just everything's more expensive here. I, that's what uh, I hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of crazy. So okay, that's um, that's really interesting. So what? If somebody does have a pretty major project, you talked about your work day either being an inspection or a project day. What is the cost on most of the projects that you work on to the homeowner? Like, what's it take to fix, you know, a mold mold issue? Yeah, good question. You know, I, I'm in a unique position because I get to make up my own cost. Um, whereas larger companies who have a sales guy come out, they've already got a structure and they say, look, it's this much per square foot. 
um, that kind of a thing. Um, I take each job unique. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking at a couple different things. I'm looking at, first of all, how much source removal of mold am I going to have to do? Meaning how much square footage? Um, I'm looking at um, how difficult is it? Do I have to put a Tyvek suit on and do an army crawl through this attic while I'm carrying equipment and cleaning materials? Um, or can I stand up in this attic? Um, things like that, crawl spaces. I'm looking at difficulties, so time on the job um, before, I, before I put together an estimate in my head. And generally, my estimates are lumped together unless, unless they ask me to itemize things, then I break it down. Um, so, but that being said, if I had to give you a range for an average job, um, if I were to look at my history, I, I would say uh, the average job for me costs about a thousand dollars. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll go into homes for as little as 200, 500, 700 for smaller jobs. I don't have a job minimum. That's another thing my competitors do is they either have a job minimum or they charge to come out. And then if you hire them, they'll apply that toward the, the cost of the project. Um, I don't charge to come out. I don't have a job minimum. Um, you know, but, uh, yeah, I, I did a job for $28,000. Uh, so that'd be a, that'd be a big one. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but, but when you average everything out, probably a thousand to 1200, um, to, and I warrant, and that's to warranty my work. I, I get my, um, if I'm treating a basement, then that basement is under warranty. You can transfer that warranty. And, and what that really means is not only have I, removed the mold from the home, but I have identified the moisture source that led to mold growth to begin with and have made the correction. Um, sometimes it's a plumbing leak and they need to call a plumber. As long as they've hired a re reputable plumber, uh, my warranty stands. Okay. Um, I'm saying the moisture won't come back. So that's why I'm going to warranty my work. Okay. Okay. That makes, that makes total sense. That seems pretty reasonable. Um, I, I would, I would add real quick that Make sure your agents are asking for warranties with mold remediation companies. They can sneak okay. a quote. Yeah, they can sneak in a quote where there's a um, a scope of work and a cost, but they don't have any verbiage about having a warranty. And if I were to do a retest on some of these companies and and send it to the lab, they could fail, the, 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 proving that the work was ineffective, and and they, the company might not come back out to do anything about it. They might they might say, well, the mold had to have grown after we were done. Right. Okay. So get, get a warranty is the bottom line. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the topics you covered just a little bit earlier that I want to go back to is the disinfecting service. So that's going to be in Seattle. We are still in phase one. We're not in phase two yet. We're very close, like maybe June one or a little bit later. A lot of businesses are going to be opening back up. And so disinfecting services are going to be kind of super high profile. Can you tell us a little bit about that, what that service looks like and like the cost and the scope of work? Absolutely. So first thing to consider is, are we disinfecting as a preventative measure or has there been an outbreak? Because if there's been an outbreak, then you're talking a lot of money, um, big company, okay. a lot of liability waiver forms and things like that. Okay. You know, we're offering to fog, disinfect real estate offices for free right now. Um, as wow. A, as a community service in a way to, and I've done uh, probably 15 so far since we opened up on wow. May. Wow, that's, that's amazing. And how, bi how big are these offices? I'm kind of curious. Some are one room, 200 square feet, and others are yep. uh, multiple levels in a building. So three, we, we went to three different floors and, and it took us two hours. Um, and, and so what I want to say is um, I have heard of Advanta Clean, who is a franchise, I heard that they quoted this is from the, we share the same insurance rep. And he told us that he told me that Advantage Clean quoted a, a building for $14,000 and they got undercut by another company for $3,500. That's quite a margin. That's massive. Yeah. What, what that means is that it's not necessarily the product, the disinfection product that we're, we're using. That's not really the important thing. You can go to the CDC website and find um, uh, CDC approved disinfectants for COVID-19 and, and, and there's a list of hundreds of things, including white vinegar. They have everything on there. They have Lysol on there. It's not the product. It's the process that makes it effective. And the process is that we use an ultra low volume sprayer, which is also commonly called a fogger, a fog machine. Okay. We, we put our disinfectant, our mold killing or virus killing um, all in one product into that machine. And we go through and the fog 
projects eight feet from the nozzle and it expands as it's projecting from the nozzle. So it fills in all the nooks and crannies, places that we can't reach to disinfect. And we go through and we do a light fogging and it's safe for plants and it's safe for um, electronics and computers like that. Um, but it, it can it can cover surface area so quickly, where, whereas going in by hand, it would take us hours to clean everything by hand and a fog machine can do it in minutes. Right. And that's what that's what we were seeing coming out of the the images we were seeing coming out of China right as the outbreak hit the US guys in massive hazmat suits with the foggers going along like the subway and that kind of thing. That's kind of what you're talking about. Correct. I, I don't know why they'd be doing that outside. I, I saw that video. Was that were they outside in the streets? Yeah, there, there was like uh, a whole bunch of them. It was almost like the army walking down the street, you know, hitting cars, just. I don't, we don't do things like China. I can tell you that. That was a, the other bizarre video that came out from one of those countries. I don't, it might've been China. I can't recall. My wife showed it to me was kids waiting in line to enter the school building. And there were guys in Tyvek suits with full face respirators on with the fog machine. And they made each kid walk through the fog. They were fogging the children who weren't wearing masks. I guess it was a whole, I hope, I hope they were told to hold their breath. Wow. I couldn't believe it. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of nonsense. So, so it's the fogging process. And then the other thing uh, um, that we offer that we do alongside is called uh, touch point surface disinfection. So while one of us is fogging, the other one is going through with a rag with the same disinfectant on that rag and, and identifying doorknobs and um, countertops, uh, desktops, um, filing cabinet handles, armchairs, or, or uh, chair armrests. Um, but Any, anywhere there's a point of contact, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. And, and so that's really that's really it. I, I, I don't know that there's going to be a huge market. I was prepared to take on a lot of COVID disinfection jobs, but I, I, I have this instinct that says there's not going to be a big market and a lot of money being spent on this. A lot of uh, businesses and buildings are handling it in-house, they're smart enough to know. They looked at the CDC website. We can use we can use our Lysol guys. We just need one of you to do it. We're setting up um, systems to handle the disinfection in house, um, and which leads me back to if there's been an outbreak in a building, I think that's where the, you're going to see these big jobs. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. We we've kind of got a system here in our office, and I'm the guy that does it. I, I'm just that guy. You know what I mean. So I just go through, clean everything. And I've been doing that um, since this all went down. And it's not that hard. It's just you got to get in there and do it. You got to get in there and do it, right? Yep. Yep, crazy. Well, Zach, I know you are a super busy guy and you've got other stuff to move on to. But before we go, I wanted to uh, find out where people can get a hold of you. If you are in the Columbus, Ohio area, and you need some mold help identifying it or remediation, what are some places people can find you, Zach? My website is moldmentorconsultants.com. That's uh, consultants is plural. It's got an S on the end, moldmentorconsultants. Okay. Okay. That will link you to my phone number. That will link you to our Facebook page um, and our Instagram page. Um, that, that's, that's the best starting point right there. Okay. And if people want some information just on mold in general, just head to your web website, correct? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Head to the website, look at the blogs, shoot me an email. I'm happy to respond and help people. Heck, if you're in Seattle and you want to call me, go for it. And I'll return your phone call. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Zach. Really appreciate having you on the podcast here. I hope your business goes well. And uh, you get to that point where you can have an employee or maybe two or five, who knows? I mean, that's how small business goes. And if, if you're hitting up podcasts and you're getting some social media out there, you, you know, you're going to get exposure. So keep doing what you're doing and um, we'll, we'll follow you online. Man, awesome, Sean. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You bet. All right, Zach. Well, thanks so much. I'm going to sign off. Thanks again for being on the podcast. Appreciated you so much. Once again, I'm Sean Reynolds from Summit Properties Northwest, Reynolds and Klein Appraisal. Today, having Mr. Zach Duffy of the Mold Mentors um, Company. There we go. If you're watching this on YouTube, you got a Mold Mentor shot right here at the end. Thanks again, Zach. We'll catch you in the next one. All right. Take care. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye. Don't forget.
forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so you'll know when our next video is out.